Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Samuel Parsons. I'm a Tableau Visionary. This week we're going to look at something slightly different. We're not going to look at tables any longer. We're going to look at recreating a certain chart type. And that's what we're looking at on screen at the moment, the gauge chart. So gauge charts are very familiar to everyone. We see them all the time in our cars on the dashboards as a speedometer. But gauge charts are not um, native to Tableau. They're not out of the box, so you have to try to recreate them using Tableau for a number of different methods. And this, uh, what we're looking at on the screen at the moment, is a visualization that I created last year, midway through last year. And that was showcasing uh, my own method to create these charts. Previously, we'd seen these charts being created using polygons, a lot of data authentication, which increases the number of marks and densifying your data is not always a great thing. And um, I thought there might be an easier way to do this, and I'll show you how. But this visualization or this method shows you um, the flexibility in terms of the aesthetic design that you can create using uh, or create these gauge charts in. So here, all of these rows are created using the same method. I've just formatted them slightly differently, creating a different design for each of them. But they all run in exactly the same way, exactly the same um, calculations that are running behind the scenes other than maybe the coloring and, and the, the sizing of the charts. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through looking at how we can create these well, not all of them, but one particular set of them. And then this uh, viz is available on my Tableau public profile for you to download. And you can have a look to see how I tweaked the design on each of these. To, so you can pick whichever one you particularly like to re buy and recreate yourself. And this method also covers um, gauge charts that run positively and negatively. And you can see the other options that we have here. So there's all sorts of different fun options you can create using gauge charts. What we're going to do is we're going to look at focusing on the basic design here that I've come up with. And um, to help us do that, I've created a template file somewhere in here. This one here. So this is a uh, just a very basic template uh, with the, the single uh, gauge chart design in here with a number of controls to change how the how the look of this gauge um, how it appears. <laughs> uh, this might change in terms of its look and feel because I haven't looked at this for a, a little while. So I haven't spent any time working on the formatting around this um, template. So by the time I publish it, it might well change slightly. But what we do is we're going to look at um, how do we create this in Tableau, what the calculations are to um, enable this, and is there any data manipulation that we need to do. So this is the standard gauge template. This is the worksheet that we're going to be looking at to see and understand how we build this. And before we start, we need to probably lay down a couple of straightforward rules or thoughts about gauge charts. Now, a typical gauge chart would run from left to right, with the left side being the zero point, and as the, the value of your data increases, the needle follows that value round. So it points further round to the right-hand side. That's how you would see it in a speedometer in your car. Um, but when we're looking at this from a database point of view or business dashboard designs, what we're going to want to do is we're going to probably want to indicate with our, um, our gauges how we are doing um, in terms of a target. So that could be a hard coded target for whatever department or category we're looking at. It could be just a simple fact that we're comparing ourselves uh, against a prior year number to say, are we are we um, outperforming our prior year for our category? And that's the basis that I've worked off of for this template. So we have in here to just illustrate, we have an area 
that is running all the way up to our target. And our target line here is our prior year value. And that is our 100% point. So if our current year sales reaches that prior year value, then we would have received, we would have achieved 100% of our target. But what we need to also do with these charts is we need to create a buffer. And that's this blue area here. Why do we need to have a buffer? Because if we didn't have a buffer, things would start looking a little bit, um, it's less intuitive in terms of the performance, put it like that. Because our needle would reach our target point, ignore the fact that the labels are overlapping here, our needle would reach our target point and it would go no further. We would have no understanding of, okay, we've reached our target, but how far past the target have we gone? Do we want to know that? If we do, then we create ourselves a little buffer. So we create ourselves something like this, where there's a, a buffer zone to say, okay, this is the next 40% based off of this value. How are we doing? How, how much further past the target have we achieved? Now, obviously, at some point, we might well meet that buffer uh, maximum. And if that happens, well, it's just, you know, you, you've done really well. But it's just an indication to say, OK, we've met our target and we've exceeded our target. So whenever you hear me talking about buffers, we're talking about this zone here. Target in this instance is prior year. It could be a parameter. And um, the I guess the other thing to mention, if I flick back to the gauge charts here, is that intrinsically people will read gauge charts against each other when they're next to each other. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you're highly likely to be looking at the needles to see how far round in each of these chart, each of these individual gauges they are to work out who's performing the best. So in this instance, we're looking at four different regions and their sales and against prior year. So you might look at these needles and look and say, okay, the West region, the needle is farthest round to the right hand side. So they must be performing the best. Now, what this is actually telling us is that each of these individual charts, the 100% point for each individual chart is their own prior year value. So 100% for the West is 7.7K. 7, 7 100% for the safe, though, is only 5.3k. It's a different target point. So what our needles are actually telling us is for each individual chart, how are you performing? So West, even though their needle is the farthest round, their sales value for that needle point is at just below $10,000 um, or pounds, whatever. Whereas East, even though their needle isn't as far around the chart, they actually have more sales. So this is um, more of a word of warning in terms of how do you signpost what's going on in terms of your dashboard if you decide to put more than one of these charts on a single dashboard together. If you do decide to put them all on, then you're going to need to be clear about the messaging to say, read them individually if they have different target points. If they have the same target point, so say you create a uh, parameter that says, I want to know how each region is performing against a common target of, say, £9,000, then each of these target points would re uh, be represented by 9000 and they would be the 100% point. And then you'd, you would be able to compare all the needles. So it's just something to consider when using these. However, I am of the thinking that these charts are quite fun to look at. People understand how to use them. Yes, they can be a little bit tricky to set up, but we'll go through that. And hopefully, whilst I was working through this again in the last week or so, looking at the calculations again of what I created here, it's not actually as hard as I initially thought it was. So. Hopefully it won't be too difficult to set up and you might be tempted to create some of these in your own business dashboards.
So let's have a look. With all that said and done, let's have a look and see how we go about creating these charts. So back into our template file. One thing I will say in this template file, I have annotated everything in terms of calculations and the captions here to explain exactly what I've just said about comparing gauge charts side by side. I've tried to order the calculations in order that we wanted to create them. And similarly, um, I've ordered the, the marks charts here in terms of numbering them in the order of importance to create a gauge chart. <coughs> now, that ordering in here might be um, a little bit messed up, they not, might not run sequentially in that because we're using marks layers or map layers to layer these different uh, visualizations on top of each other to create the designs that we're working on here. So map layers, as you might well have noticed that we're using latitude and longitude on here, is something that we'll get into towards the end of the, the build essentially. So this is the same thing stripped down. So if we go back to the chart here, if you were to pay attention to the prior year line or the end points here or even the 50% line, when I flick over to this next chart, this next version of it, you can see when I flick backwards and forwards how those lines line up in terms of the build. So for the prior year marker, that's appearing just at the end of this segment that we have here. And what we're doing is I've all I've done is I've turned off from the view all of the extra elements that we had here that created the, the chart. So all of these little elements here, so I can turn on the needle so you can see what we had previously. All we want to do at the moment is we're concentrating on this area here, the gauge dial, which is a marks card for a pie chart, which you probably have already guessed that we're looking at a pie chart here. And that is the underlying method here that we're using is we're creating a um, gauge chart using a pie chart in Tableau. So there's no polygons going on here. There is a slight date, date, uh, date identification happening, but I will explain that as we as we move forward. Over on the left hand side with our calculations, we've got a second for Superstore, which is the, the default um, Tableau data set that we get with Tableau. So these are just some of the default fields that you would intrinsically get in Superstore. I have hidden away some of the fields that we're not using. Basic measure calculations are the standard calculations that you would expect for current year sales, prior year sales, identifying those. And most of these are used in terms of the labeling that we have here with the numbers that we're seeing, the percentages, uh, all of this stuff. So these basic measure calculations are not really used in terms of building the chart. Only the, the one measure that is used in terms of building this is our prior year sales. So we need to identify the prior year, prior year sales. And the reason for that is that we are using the prior year as our target point. So that is the basis for how we build this chart. We're saying, what is the target? What's the 100% point? And then we can build everything from there. So then we've got some calculations, just a set of three calculations here. Let's expand that out a little bit further. Three calculations that are working out the sizing of this um, pie chart and the segments that we have here. And then the segments are what I've called divisions. And we have a few calculations around working out the divisions and how we order those divisions in the chart. After that, everything else is what I would call fun. So we've got make point build, ca build cakes. So we've got quite a few little calculations going on here. Each of these um, icons with the globe are our make point calculations that essentially we're bringing on onto the sheet to create ourselves a, a marks card that gives us the ability to then build another layer of the visualization. All these other calculations are basically um, supporting the make point calculations that we're seeing here. So underlying method, how, how do we make this work? So one thing to note with 
uh, pie charts in Tableau is pie charts in Tableau start from the 12 o'clock position and they run round clockwise um, to get to the end obviously. There's no way of changing where the pie chart stops, starts sorry, in Tableau. So what we have to do is we have to be quite um, clever in manipulating the, um, the divisions so we control uh, where they appear and in what order. And that'll become more apparent in a second. Now, how are or what why do we need divisions how are we creating these extra these divisions in our pie chart here this is where we need to go to our data source window if i can click on it and move away and i'll click on it so our data source is simply tableau uh, superstore and then i've got an extra um a source uh, joined in with a the logical relationship join and this source is a essentially a data model that I created in Excel and it is a single column and that column runs from 1 to a random number of 81 now why is it 81 I'll explain that but what's happening here in terms of the connection between them just created a cut and calculation which I put a zero in on the orders side and a zero in on the um, data model side. That is one equals the other. So what that means is for every row where we have a zero, which what we're doing is we're putting a zero on every row. So for every row in the orders table, we are connecting or we're densifying it. So we're duplicating that row for each one of the rows that we have in our data model. So in this instance, we are densifying the orders table by a factor of 81. Because we have 81 rows in here. Now you don't need to necessarily have 81 rows, and I'll explain that in a second. Because what I've created here for the data model is something that will allow for people to alter the extent or the, um, the granularity of their gauge charts. So I've created a, a, a flexible set of parameters that allows you to alter this to your heart's content within a certain set of boundaries. So you might decide eventually that actually you've chosen the design from those designs that I've shown you. You know the granularity that you need and therefore you might be able to change that um, densification model to be less uh, number of rows. I'll explain that now. So if we were to look at this tooltip and we looked at the top line of that tooltip where it says original div number one. So that's the original number of the, um, the division. So think of that in that identification model with the numbers running sequentially down that, those rows, that's the first row in the list. If I follow this round, you can see that number at the top there going up just by one each time. So we get to 28 and 29. So this is telling us that we have 29 divisions in this um, gauge chart. And that twen those 29 divisions are creating this look and feel to our gauge. So essentially, if we're gonna stick with this setup, then we would only need a data model that add 29 rows to it, not 81. So you could quite clearly save some of that densification by reducing that data model down to 29 rows. But this potentially could change if we were to increase the, um, the buffer on the um, gauge chart itself. So let's go back to our gauge chart. Now we can see that we've got uh, an extra 100% buffer in terms of this range. And in doing that, we end up with 41 divisions that are being used to create that, that chart. We could change the increments here, so the granularity, to instead of 5% um, sections or segments, to 2.5% segments. So you get a finer granularity which would work with um, a different level of your data 
but, but that uses the full 81 divisions in our data model. So that's the, the most granular version of this in terms of what I've set up in the template. But obviously we could make it less granular and we go to 10% divisions and we might say let's only show maybe we only want to go to 100% in our chart. So again we're working on, on this basis but we actually only have 11 divisions so at the very highest granularity then we only need to densify our data by 11, 11 times. Remember with um, using polygons um, you're more than likely to have to just default densify it by 360 times because you probably need 180 points to draw a, a nice circle around one edge of this chart and then another 180 points to draw the other edge of the circle around. So even though there is some densification going on here, it's not as high amount of densification that you would from a, a method using polygons, for example. But you can see that there is some level of flexibility to this method. So let me just put this back. So now we understand that we're creating a densification model that could be reduced down if you need to in terms of your designs. And we're using that densification model to create the segments of our pie chart. But as we've mentioned, the segments of the pie chart should run from the top here, from the 12 cent position, uh, 12 o'clock position, round and back to the 12 o'clock position. But what we want is we want our gauge chart to run from this point and run round to this point here. So we need to do some clever little manipulation in terms of the maths. So let's get into the calculations. So we're just going to dive into this. I'm not going to show you how to create the prior year values. Um, you can pick that up from the from the template yourself. I'm sure you already know how to do stuff like that. So again, I've tried to number things in order in terms of which way we're going to work through these and which um, the the order in which they feed into each other. So the first calculation here is um, the the max chosen percentage range in the view. So if I edit that, so what is that? That is literally just what's the what's the parameter that we've chosen here? So we've got 140%. So the max percentage range is 140% that runs from here all the way around to there, because that's in view. This segment here, I would say, is not in view because that segment is hidden away. We don't show it. So if I look at this calculation, this calculation is here because I, in the previous versions, maybe even in that version that I showed you with all the different pie charts, uh, gauge charts, there were um, a couple of parameters that I was selecting between. So uh, I might have to rewrite some of this before I publish the template. But essentially all we're doing now is we're just taking the round of that, that value. So we're rounding the number so that when we, um, so when we're taking into account the number of the, the increment granularity compared to the gauge chart um, percentage. So it rounds to the, the, higher, the higher figure. So essentially this is just taking what is the percentage we want to show in terms of the buffer or, uh, compared to the prior year value. Next, we need to find the full gauge value. So what is the full value for the whole of this pie chart? So we need to base that off of our target point, our prior year sales. So I've got a prior year sales fixed calculation. So it's just probably, uh, because I've written fixed, it's probably going to be an LOD. Um, I can just have a look at that. Yeah, so it's an LOD that we're working off of some of these um, fields like category and subcategory and region. So what we're doing is we're taking our prior year target. So this field here is the, the field that you would change if you wanted to hard code it to a parameter. You, maybe you create yourself a parameter and you type in a value. You put that in here and replace this prior year sales value. And this will underpin all the other calculations in terms of the sizing of these segments. And we're taking that value and we're timesing it by the maximum percentage shown in the view, which is this calculation. 
so that's the round of the percentage value here and then we're dividing it by the percentage of the gauge shown in the view which is this parameter here so in this calculation say our prior year sales was 10,000 we would be timesing it by our max gauge percentage which would be the 1.4 and then we're dividing it by the 0.7 so I could probably show you how that works in Excel easier than trying to explain in terms of the maths so say we have 10,000 we've got um, 140% buffer and then we've got 70% uh, of our gauge is shown so what we're going to do here is we're going to say take our 10,000 and times it by our 1.4 buffer let me zoom in just in case this doesn't come across in the video particularly well so 10,000 sales Oops, just quickly narrate this uh, buffer then uh, uh, this um, gauge shown. So these are um, percentages turned into decimals. So we have our sales at our target, our buffer by timesing it by, by a buffer is 140%, so we are adding on 4,000 to our sales as that buffer range. And then our age shown is 0 0.7. So if we were to take that and divide it by 0 0.7, then our full gauge chart would be um, 20,000 pounds. And that what that 20,000 pounds represents is that represents the full extent of the pie, including this area that isn't shown. So what is this 70% element? So probably easier to show you on this side. So if I were to put this, so 70%, sorry, 70% is showing of the full circle, how much do we want to represent the gauge? How much of the circle do we, do we want to show as a gauge? So from here to here is 70% of the full circle. Don't think of it as uh, like you would normally with a pie chart where it's like 90% is a quarter of it. Uh, 360 degrees we're not talking about degrees we're talking about the percent of the whole circle so 70% runs from here to here if I were to change that to half of the circle then it runs from here to here so you've got half of the circle 50% of the gauge is shown in the view and then you would end up with a design like this so this is where again if I go back to the, this you see that we're mostly working on a 70 or 75 percent range but some of the designs use the 50 percent shown in a view some use less than 50 percent and that's how we can start playing around with this design to create the look and feel that we want so maybe we say 40 percent and you get this version of the chart that it doesn't um, it's just a different look feel, a different aesthetic essentially. Um, but for me, I found that I quite liked the 70% mark because it gave enough room to put a label in, in, the, in between the, the start and the finish side of things. And um, it gives more of the actual gauge to run the needle through. And so you can see a little bit more accuracy with what's going on there. Whereas if things were truncated, maybe let's go I don't know 30% let's make it really truncated then there's less room for your needle to move around I hope this is making sense so that's um, the full gauge value so we've worked out based off of our prior year value what's the full value that represents our whole pie chart the next one is so what's the value that we're showing in our view so we're taking that full value and we're timesing it by the percent of the gauge shown in the view so the full value times 0.7 gives us that value again that's a bit of a roundabout way of doing it but i'm using both of these calculations so what this is telling us is from here to here what does that 140 percent represent which was 
essentially are hundred and uh, are fourteen thousand in this instance. So the the full value was the twenty thousand. Our target was the ten thousand, and the the value in view is the fourteen thousand. If we're using those numbers. So we need to have these defined first, those three calculations, so we understand based off of the prior year value how we can then divide up the chart using our divisions. So we start off with the number of divisions required. Let's get a drink a second. So based off of our maximum percentage in the view, which is our 140,000, uh, 140%, uh, yeah, because that's, that's our first calculation. So that's just taking that and rounding that. Based off of that value, um, how many divisions do we need to allow for the um, divisions to line up with the target? So we want the divisions to line up with the target point, the 100% mark. So we're taking that 140,000, uh, 140%, so 1.4, and we're timesing it by 10. So timesing it by 10 will give us 14 divisions. So why am I doing that? Because our increments, our granularity, can all, um, all these options will can fall into a, um, a multiple of or a division of 10. So um, so we end up with saying 14 and then we're timesing that value by the granularity that we've chosen up here. So when the, the chart is at 10% then we're just keeping, we're timesing it by one. So we're keeping 14 divisions. So if we had 10% uh, 10 increments then we'll have 14 divisions that make up this area. If we had 5% uh, increments then um, we would times that 14 by 2 so we would double it so we get in this space we would get double the amount of divisions so they would move in 5% increments. And again if we chose the 2.5% increments then a finer granularity then we would get um, we times it by four and again we'd get four times the number of it uh, four times 14 for the number of divisions that we need in here so that tells us how many divisions we want to line up with our um, calculations So then we want to create an ID number. So it says ID the last division not in view. What does that mean? So that means that to be able to sort these divisions, so they run se sequentially from this point to this point, we need to identify the last division that makes up the remainder of the pie chart. And we need to tag that with a number so that we can sort it in a cert always in the in the right order <laughs> okay so division number is um the number that comes from our data model that we've joined so that is just the standard one two three all the way down to 81. And we're saying if our division number is equal to the number of divisions required that we just worked out by doing the 14 times the granularity if that is equal to the number of divisions required plus one, then that means that we've got number of divisions required plus one division to make up for this section, then we want to tag that with a zero. Otherwise, if our um, division numbers are less than um, the number of number required plus one, or it could be less than or equal to the number of divisions required. That might make more sense in terms of explaining. So if our division numbers are less than or equal to the number of divisions required, so we have, let's say, in this instance, we've got 28 divisions. Move that over. So we've got 28 divisions. If our division number is equal to 28 or less, then we want to just keep that division number. Otherwise, make it null.
we don't want in we don't want to account for it so we are tagging all of these divisions with their normal division number that comes from the model and this division we are making sure that we're tagging it with a zero and that zero is going to prove helpful in terms of the sorting we want to size these divisions on the pie chart so we have a little calculation here that helps us work out what the size is so if our division number is this is again probably less than or equal to the number of divisions required so again if our division number is one if our division is one of these smaller divisions going round then we want to take the full gauge value which was the full value of this and then we're times it by the number uh, the percentage of gauge shown in view and divide it by the number of divisions required whereas when I think about this now I could probably write that a little easier by just taking this full gauge value in view and dividing it by a number required but essentially what we're doing is we're saying okay what's the value of this divide it up by the number of divisions that we need and that gives us the value for each of these individual divisions so that we create them equally in sizing and then um, the last element of this is to say okay so if that is the case if we're looking at those divisions then we're giving them an equal value based off of what we want in terms of the conditions that we've already created up here and then we're saying else if our division number is the maximum the um, the maximum of divisions that we require plus one which is 29 in this instance if our division number equals that so if we're identifying this area here then we want to take the full value of the gauge but the opposite of the percentage that we're looking at here so we're taking 30 cents so we're taking the full value one take away 0.7 which gives us 30 percent so times our full value of the gauge by the 30 percent that makes up the whole 100 percent so this is representing 30 percent of the gauge and that gives us the value for this otherwise we're not interested we'll make everything else null so now we're sizing all these equally based off of this range and then what's remaining as part of the full gauge value will will tag this last division with that size and then we want to sort them <laughs> and this one's a bit more awkward in terms of um <laughs> if you thought the others were awkward this is a bit more awkward so this is where we're say, saying that our sorting our pie chart runs from the 12 o'clock position all the way around to the 12 o'clock position again if you look at the bottom of this tool tip now the division sort number this is the result of this calculation this is how we're telling tableau to um, place these divisions so we're saying that we need to do this so that we always place this um, this segment at the bottom and we always have an equal amount of segments left and right of it so even though this original division number is 15 our division sort is giving it 0 0.5 and then if we run this range you can see it's going up by one for each division until we come this one and then it continues all the way around so we're at 28.5 even though these original numbers are 1 round to 14 here and 15 round to 28 there this is our way of putting this um, division at the bottom in the middle all the time as we change our granularities and percentages and values that will always remain at the bottom in the middle so how is this working so again I've, I've narrated this I might even have to talk through this in terms of the calculation oh didn't mean to do that I'll do that so, we're looking at the calculation where we've created that ID for them so we've said it's the it's the normal division number if it's one of these or zero if it's this one so if our ID number 
is greater than the number of divisions required plus 1 divided by 2. So our number of divisions here is 28 plus 1 is 29. Divide that by 2 is 14.5. So if our division number is more than 14.5, so that's all of this stuff round on the right hand side here, 15, 16, 17 to 28. If it is one of those, then give us the division number um, that it has, take away 14.5. Okay. So that's why we have 15, the division sort number results in 0.5, because we're saying 15 take away 14.5. And it runs round until we get to 13.5. Because we're saying 28 take away 14.5 gives us our 13.5. So this is ordering these sequentially. And that division sort number will obviously change as we change the, the granularity and everything. Else, if it's not that, then give us the ID number plus um, the division number. Uh, the total number of divisions plus 1 divided by 2. So we're saying now, if it's not one of these here, then we want to take what the ID number is, in this case it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to 14, and add on the 14.5. So 0 becomes 14.5, that becomes the next smallest in the list, and then these all add up from there to 15.5 sequentially. So that's my method of sorting these divisions so that we always get this point at the bottom. So we identify those that are more than half of the total number of divisions that we need. And we're dividing that by 2. And then um, and then everything else, we're, we're increasing that division number. So it runs sequentially from 0 0.5 all the way around 14.5, which is our midpoint all the way around to 28.5. And that is the setup for all these gauges. So then, what do we do? We then have to build this out using make point. So, I guess this is where we would want to talk about map layers. Have a look. So map layers in Tableau. The first point that we've got here with make point is our gauge center. So let's have a look at that. Our uh, make point is essentially saying that we have uh, attitude and longitude point. This is a calculation that was created for maps specifically. Okay, so when you use make point, you get a a geographical um, data type and when you place that onto your um, your uh, worksheet it would default give you a map if I were to double click on this we give we create a map using that make point value and 0, 0.0 in terms of longitude and latitude would locate you somewhere just off the coast of Africa we can make use of this in terms of creating those visualizations that you can see so that people do with make point and in this case um, the gauge charts so there's two ways we can play with this one is we could stick with the map and we could then format it or change the map formatting to remove the uh, remove the background so you don't see the map anymore and then we work off of the longitude and latitude points in this scale. The method that I quite like to use is I would switch these um, axes over. So if I just click on the swap rows and columns, we're still using longitude and latitude, but we now have axes that we can play with. And that can be quite crucial in terms of when you're creating map point visualizations, you might want to play around with the, the axes. But to um, when, you've, when you've switched the axes like this, if you were then to try and bring on another uh, marks cut, it won't allow you to do that immediately. 
So what you have to do is you have to, before you can do that, is you have to switch back to the longitudinal latitude. When you bring it on here, it says add a marks layer. So we can add it here. We don't draw it, drag it and drop it here. We add it to where it's highlighting in orange up here. Let go and it gives us two marks cards. Now, when we switch it back with our axes and switch these over, when we bring this over, we now get that option up here. So you need to have two make points before you switch the axes to then add more and more. So then you can add as many as you like to this. It doesn't have to be the same one, it could be other ones. And then you start getting all these cards appearing. And this is how you start layering up on the visualization side things. The order in which you put these marks cards in uh, will determine the order in which the layering visually is happening. So the marks card at the bottom here would be the very bottom of the stack in terms of the view. So that would be at the back of the, the visualization. You can drag these around to change the order in which they are working in. So you can move things from the front of the, the foreground of the view to the background. So that's a little stop tour of uh, map uh, layers. And that's what, essentially what I have done here. So I've got my latitude and longitude. If I were to show my headers, you would see that I've got um, axes here. So that's the method that I'm using to create this. So the gauge dial, so this chart here, all I'm doing is I'm using the, so I'm trying to drag this out. Oh, wait, let me, okay, fine. I'm using the make point one, which is the gauge center, which is zero, zero. So zero, zero is this point in the middle here. I then added the division size to the angle. So that gives me the size of the segments for each of those divisions. I've given my ID for those divisions so I can separate out my pie chart by that level of detail. And then the last thing I'm going to put out, these these four um, uh, peels here are all down to the, the actual um, tooltip that's showing on here. But the last one I'm just going to put, call out is this sum zero. I've got it on size. If I take this off, then oh, I didn't come off. <laughs> what did I what did I just take off? If I take this off, then my pie chart doesn't particularly fill my screen very well. So if I undo that, I'll just undo that again just in case I did take something else off. If I add a measure onto size on the pie, then the size of the pie becomes just generally larger. So I tend to do that. It doesn't need to be any particular number. Um, I just used zero in this instance. So that's the gauge dial. Then what I did was I created a cover for the dial to create more of a donut chart style option. So the dial cover here. So if I bring that in, we create a donut ch chart. That's using exactly the same make point center calculation. So I'm just using this calculation here and again, some look so I'm using some one it doesn't doesn't actually uh, I'm using a different value because if I use some zero I think then they would line up being the same size but I can obviously play around with this in terms of the design how thick I want my gauge sort of target area to at the moment you can see I am highlighting all these different um, segments what we can do is in the drop down menu for each of these cards you have a disabled selection option so I can't select that white circle in the middle I can select all the stuff behind it though from the gauge dial so if I click onto here and say disable selection then when I hover I can't select any of those segments so that is crucial to really hiding the magic of how you built this okay so we've got a bit of a, a donut chart going on here. So let's go back to this gauge dial and we'll put bring in some color. So we'll just edit this and show you the color calculation. I took the color off of this one because um, I just wanted it to be helpful to show what's happening. So in terms of this color gauge calculation, so in the 
um, the viz with the multiple gauge charts we saw lots of different color options with terms of gradients and things and that's where I would just be playing with this color calculation you can see what I did on each of those um, in the other visualization but for this one where we were highlighting one color where it went up to the target and then a, the buffer range which was beyond that target it was a different color and then um, the last segment was a different color again so all I'm doing here is I'm saying if it's the last, if our if our ID for each of these segments equals zero, which means if, if it's this big segment at the bottom in the middle, then say null. If it's not that, then do a test to say does our ID, is our ID less than or equal to um, 10 times the max granularity? That's weird. Is that right? It's going to say is that less than the target? Why is it 10 times? Da, 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 da. <laughs> Why is that? Oh, yes, it's okay, fine. So it's, it's 10 times because there's 10 segments in terms of this, I believe. <laughs> so this might be a bit clunky. You can always change it. Um, I'll bring that onto color. It will break it because the ordering here is it's it's ordering the segments by the color first. So if I bring this down the list in here, then it's going to work um, based off of the sort that we have on this um, uh, ID here. So is that right? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So we've got twenty because we're at five percent increments, I think. So our because we're saying ten times five percent is times two, so twenty. So, so what we're saying is, um, in this setup with how many increments we need to get to that target point, is that we. are we will always have 10 times the granularity number of segments to that target point. So we're just saying uh, is that ID to that to that value. If it is true, if it's not false. So then our color legend here is where that is true, we are coloring those segments. Whether it's false, we are coloring the segments beyond. Where it's null, and all I've done is I think I've just taken a, a white color on this yes so i've just made it white the same color as the background but because you can't click on it nobody nobody's any of any of the one when they look come to look at this and then obviously i wouldn't put the borders on here in terms of the design of this you can have the borders if you want um i might even have put some borders on some of the designs on the other ones so okay so we're getting there this is taking a lot longer than i suspected in terms of the video but hey um, and then we want to build out all the other elements to this. So let's have a look at the pointer. I might not go through everything on here because I think you can work out in terms of angles and things with the the zero lines and the 50% lines and the 100% lines. But in terms of the pointer, the where have, where have we actually got to in this? We want to create a pointer base. So this is just the central point so the base of the pointer I think it's quite nice to have that there again that's just the gauge point center I mean it's just I've used a pie chart because pie charts tend to draw nicer than circles on Tableau and I've just sized it down so it's very small nothing more you can't select it disabled and then we have a pointer needle and that's the one that we need to work out so that's going to run from this point to that point over there and we're using a line so exactly that we're going to run our line from this point from the center to this point to the far side and we're using our division number to decide that so there's not a lot going on here just to accept a new make point calculation and our make point calculation is what's our x position and what's our y position for the pointer and our x and y position is going to be based off of a bit of trigonometry so our x position is, um, if I get this right around, 
um, if I hopefully I've labeled it X in the right way so our X position would be our horizontal point so if our division is if the division number is 1 then give us an X point of 0 so we we'll start in the middle start here if our division number is 2 then we go to uh, the radius of the pointer so I've given a, a parameter here so we can change the size of the pointer and times that by cos of the angle so we're doing a little bit of our trigonometry to say okay what's the hypotenuse cos of the angle will give us the the x length so we say okay from from zero it goes across here and says we're going to plot it from the x point here and then we'll do with the y point to move the end of the pointer to the top so okay so we need an angle now our angle of the pointer is somewhere in here uh, no that's the target angle of the pointer so <laughs> right now we're going to work in radians three uh, converting 360 degrees to a percentage point a portion of the gauge shown in the view okay fun right um, just what you want at the end of the end of a long video is to start working with trigonometry right uh, okay so let me try and work through this um i now understand what people think when they come to my business and they look at them this day right how has he done this so if our current year sales divided by the full value in the view is greater than one then we want then we're returning one if our current year sales else do the current year sales divided by the full value in the view okay so let's go back to our spreadsheet so our current sales is let's say our current sales is 12,000 and we're saying that if our current year sales is less than the sale uh, the amount shown in the view which was the buffer is that right carry your sales divided by the full gauge value oh full gauge value in the view sorry <laughs> so that divided by the full gauge value in the view 0.6 so if it's greater than one so if it is so if our yeah so okay so if our current year sales value is more than the full value in the view uh divided by the full value in the view uh, so the full value in the view yeah so that's not um, it's not the full value it's the full value i was right the first time it's not that figure it's that one there the full value in the view if okay so if that divided by that so yeah that makes more sense because if our sales is beyond our uh, buffer value that we're showing so it would be more than one so the sales divided by the full value in the view if that's greater than one then just default it to one okay which would say I think this is going to say if it will default to the full um, the full position essentially so we won't get the needle running past that buffer zone it won't move into this zone down here else give us the value that it is yeah so okay so if it if it runs past the full value then just default it to the full value otherwise just default it to where it is currently in terms of its gauge position so that gives us a, a either a, uh, somewhere between zero and one from this calculation then we are taking that value and we're timesing that by 360 degrees times the gauge percentage of the shown in the view so 360 degrees um, so 360 times 0.7 
252. I've lost myself. Let me think about that. Now, I know that these are moving the needle around in terms of radiance. So we're now working in 360 degrees in terms of the chart. And I know that the 360 degrees are going to start from the top point. So what we're doing in this section here is we're moving the needle to start from this section here, not from the top point. So we're saying we're um, 360 divided by that divided by half. Yeah, because if I take off, if I take off this 90% and apply that, then it moves down here. If I take off this and apply that, then I'll position for all of this starts over here so it start it runs from here all the way around to here so I am adjusting this so that our needle starts at this point so I could probably show you that by taking this out so taking out the part where we are accounting for the sales I think I think I need to take that bit yeah so taking taking out the part where we're accounting for the sales what we're doing is we're adjusting the needle to start from the start position using these two calculations so one of them is taking the 360 degrees um, how much of the th how much of the 360 degrees are shown in the view and taking half of that and 90 degrees to move it round. <laughs> Don't ask me why it's 90 degrees. can't remember why it's 90 degrees. That's not very helpful to you, but it works. <laughs> um, if I took these off, then the needle would start at the top, I think. Oh, and then, of course, it's got nothing to work with. Um, so let's just put a zero in there. It starts from the side. Right, okay, so that's the 90 degrees. Take off the 90 degrees. Nah. Take off the 90 degrees. Oh, I've broken it now, haven't I? Um, let's just undo that. Undo that. Right. Um, let's take that out. Okay, so we've moved the needle to the start position with the. So okay, so my understanding with terms of the radians, radians don't start from the twelve o'clock position. The radians start from the three o'clock position. Helpful. So we, what I was doing here was I said, okay, let's start it off from the the ninety degree position uh, from the twelve o'clock position by moving it ninety degrees round the circle. And then we're going to move it around half of the full value in terms of degrees, which is this section here. Okay, we're getting there. So that then moves it round. So that's why we're saying, okay, so how many degrees are in this full part in the view? And we'll divide that by two and we'll move it back round to there. So then from that position, we are then calculating in terms of radians, the movement round the circle. So we're taking a percentage essentially is what we're doing here. So what percent of the full gauge is our sales representing? So if this is 14,000 the full gauge and our sales is 12,000 then that gives us 85% um, round, the, round the gauge is what we should be having. So if our buffer is 14,000 and our current sales is 12,000, then we should work our way around 85% of the gauge that is shown. 
So not 100%, but 80%, 85%, so somewhere around here. If it is more than one, if it's more than 100%, then we're defaulting it to one. We're defaulting it to this position. And then we are timesing that by the percent of the, the amount of radians that the gauge shown in the view represents. That's it. <laughs> okay, so that gives us our angle. And then we're applying that angle to the trigonometry calculations for the x position, and then exactly the same thing for the y position for the is, is we're looking at the sign this time to say hypotenuse and angle gives the sign. And so we get the vertical part of the positioning for this point of the line. So it's coordinates. It's saying what's our x coordinate and what's our y coordinate. That will change as you change the size of the pointer. So let's make the pointer really big. And you can see it's, it's actually cut off, the, cut off the screen here. But we can change the size of the pointer to whatever we want. And again, that will affect the aesthetic, the aesthetics. So obviously we don't want it that small because there's just no point because you can't tell where it's pointing to. I think I had it somewhere around here. So that allows us to play around with the size of this line. Change, change the size of the needle if you want to. You can put size onto division number or division number onto size. So you can have a small point and a large point or a large point and a small point. So you can change the size of the line and the look and feel of the line as you like. And that is the pointer. Then we've got all the other elements here that we can add in a 100% target line. Again, the target point is coordinate based. What's our X position? What's our Y position? And we'll draw a line. But you'll notice, uh, I can't zoom in because I don't know how in terms of the video, but you'll notice that if the eagle-eyed nun amongst you will see that this end of the line has got a curved element, this end of the line is cut off. And that's because the target line here is above the dial, which is the coloured section, in terms of its layering. So it's here. So the dial's there, it's above the dial, but it's below the cover, so the white section. So if I take the cover and put it below the target line, you'll see that the target line is drawing from the zero point all the way to here. You don't have to have it from zero point. You could make it so it starts over here, an equal section across if you like to. Um, but for me, it just made it a little easier just to hide it behind the white circle that was there. Exactly the same things happen with the 50% mark and the zero line and the max position. I think these are all the, the basic elements that you need to have in terms of help reading this chart, so you can understand that zero starts here. 50% of our prior year sales is somewhere over here. It's not at the top, yeah, because it's not. Our prior year target is here, so it's 50% between zero and the target, which is a 90 degree angle off of there. And then um, we can show the full extent is 140% of the prior year. And then you can create some more labeling that appears at this position, so a band labeling would be, where is it, here. It's just hard coding a number to say, okay, we'll start at the zero point in, on the x-axis and we'll just move it down to 0 0.5 in terms of the, the y-axis. So I've got a feeling my, if I show my, uh, show, which one is it, show header, yeah, so you can see, actually, weirdly, I don't know why, but my axis is reversed. I've got minus one at the top and one down here. So I've gone zero and then 0 0.5. Maybe that was just a, I mean, that happened and I just stuck with it. So then I can locate the band position in between the, the space that I've created in terms of the, the percentage shown of the gauge. And then I can bring in more information about the region that I'm looking at and then elements that create the rest of the, the design. And now I've got everything in view. I can't interact with any of this because I don't need to. It's just a KPI. I don't want tool tips from it. I want to select it in any way. So all the information is in the design itself. And that, as they say, is that. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. 
I'm sure this might be helpful for some people. I will publish this viz soon. I'll just alter this. But as you can see, in terms of the fun elements of this, you can now start understanding how I created some of this stuff. So I've got um, borders showing on my divisions on here. I'm running color sequentially with the divisions. And then I might say, once you get to a target point, you might want to then, or a current here value, then color in the rest of it a different color. So it shows the value that you've got to, like this, all the way up to here, or close enough and everything else is still to be achieved. Um, all sorts of different things. So this, to create this spiral effect, this is actually a shape that I've created, kind of like a, um, a seashell sort of shape that runs like that. And that creates that sort of smaller to larger effect on the design. Um, I've just shown that you can create these gauge charts in a very small way as well. So they don't take up very much space on your um, on your dashboards. You can have them, you know, you could code in um, or create calculations to create segments to say this is 50, uh, 25 percent, 50 percent, you know, to 100 percent and color them like that. It's all around coloring, formatting to the look and the feel for your design. So there should be plenty of inspiration in here for your own designs but this is the power of map layers and I guess the last thing I haven't really sort of shown you in terms of this design is looking at this everything on here is 46 marks it's hardly anything if I were to increase it to its full capacity in terms of increments and um, all the, the segments we get to 97 marks in total not massive in terms of a, um, a visualization point of view um, it's not going to kill your computer to calculate it if I bring this down to say it's minimum how many marks we got so we've got 28 marks in terms of building that but that was my method uh, let me know what you think about it um, please keep commenting it's really helpful to see how useful this is to people and people seem to be liking the videos so far so i'll continue doing them um and thank you for persevering and getting to the point of the video um i don't know which one's going to be next but we've got a couple of ideas in mind uh, and yes have a nice day everybody and i'll see you next time